whiteboard and this computer. Okay, so this is Perashat Devarim. We're studying Perashat Devarim today. Perashat Devarim, just by way of introduction, just so you know, you understand what's happening here. And it, it's as follows. The journey through the, through the desert has been completed. The 40 years have come to an end. It is now Rosh Chodesh Shevat. And Moshe Rabbeinu gathers the Jewish people and he lets them know that very soon he will be departing. He will be leaving. And he tells the Jewish people over the next um, month and a, and a week, while I'm still here, let me have, let me give you the opportunity to review the entire Torah with you. Because as you know, the entire Chumash, the first four books, Bereshit, Shemot, Vayikra, Demidbar, these books were taught by Moshe Rabbeinu to the Jewish people, right? All the misvot in the books were taught by Moshe Rabbeinu to the Jewish people. The stories in the book of Bereshit were taught by Moshe Rabbeinu to the Jewish people. So those books, that, those books are now complete. In the book of Devarim, it's Moshe Rabbeinu repeating, and not just repeating, but, and, and here's a great Hidush from my father. That's, no, that's the book of Tehidim. Uh, here, get a um, book of Devarim that should be there. So uh, you too also get a book of Devarim. So the word, this is um, an important thing. The word used to describe the book of Devarim in Hazal is Mishneh Torah. Mishneh Torah. Why is the book of Devarim called Mishneh Torah? So in Hebrew, the word Shana means to repeat. But it doesn't just mean to repeat. What does the word Shana also mean in Hebrew? It means to change something. So the word Shana means to change. Why? Because whenever you repeat something, you don't repeat exactly verbatim what was already said, but you're going to add certain things to it. You're going to add certain laws. You may bring certain nuances, certain details, so the book of Devarim is not just a blind repetition. We, we wouldn't need a, a new book if that's what it, what, what it was. But rather, in it, there's an elaboration. There's an additional flavor to what's happening. You understand? That's why it's called Mishneh Torah. It's the repetition of the Torah, but it's also a reformulation of the Torah. Okay? So, the, so, 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 so just to summarize, all of the five books, Bereshit, Shemot, Vayikra, Demidbar, Devarim, all of the five books were taught by Moshe Rabbeinu to the Jewish people. But the important thing is that the book of Devarim didn't happen yet. So the book of Devarim happens during the last days of Moshe Rabbeinu's life. But this is Rosh Chodesh uh, Shabbat, and Moshe Rabbeinu ultimately leaves the Jewish people on the seventh day of Adar, which is about 38, 39 days later. You understand the uh, scenario? So that's a scenario, that's where we're at. And I want to read to you the first Pasuk. And I'm going to give you a fabulous explanation to the first Pasuk. This is not my explanation. This is the explanation of one of the great, great commentaries on the Humash. My father actually considers him to be one of the greatest commentators on the Humash. And I'm talking about the B. Eliyahu ben Amozeg, the B. Eliyahu ben Amozeg in the book M. Lamikra. The book Em La Mikra, it's um, about um, 200 years ago. Em La Mikra from Livorno, Italy. Rabbi Eliab ben Abuzeg was truly um, a historical uh, hacham in Amisel, not just Gadol Hador, but one of the greatest hachamim. And um, I want to read for you the first pasuk. I want to share with you my confusion all these many years. And I want to tell you how Rabbi Eliab ben Abuzeg, hacham Eliab ben Abuzeg, he um, dispel the confusion that I had these many years. So also open up the uh, open up the first pasuk in the book of Devarim. Here it is. I'm going to read the pasuk, and you have it on the screen. You're, you can see the share screen, correct? Elia Devarim. Everybody's good. Okay. So here goes. Elia Devarim, Asher Diber Moshe El Kol Yisrael Ve'Aber Hayarden 
במדבר, בערבה, מול סוף, בן פרן ובן תופל, בלבן וחסרות ידי זהב. אוקיי, let me tell you the פסוק, let me explain to you the פסוק, and then I think you will see the, 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 the difficulty. The פסוק literally means these are the words. The Moshe Rabbein spoke to the Jewish people. He spoke to them when they were on the um, uh, eastern bank of the Jordan River. Bamidbar, in the desert. Ba'arava, the Arava is the area by Moab, the fields outside Moab. Monsu, by, um, um, by the Red Sea, right? The Red Sea split by the Red Sea. Then Paran, between a place called Paran, and then there was another place called Tofel. Velavan, another place is called Lavan. Chaserot, another place. Bevi, Zahav, these are all names of places. Let me tell you, well, it's obviously a bit problematic. Where did he speak these words? Where's the book of Devarim? Well, we know that right now, he's actually in Arbot Moab. So what does it mean? He, it, it's in Eber Ayarden, he's in the Midbar, he's in the Araba, he's in Monsu. Where is he? So the Hachamim, I'll give you the, the, the Midrash. I'm going to give you the Midrash, and the Midrash says as follows. Yes, physically, as a matter of GPS, Moshe Rabbeinu is located right now in Arvot Moab. And these words are being spoken in Arvot Moab. But he's reminding them, and he's giving them tochaha, he's rebuking them over things that took place in in Eber HaYarden, over things that took place in the Midbar, over things that took place in the Araba. Um, for example, in the Araba, they made the Avera with uh, Baal Peor, with um, the Midianite woman, right? Monsuf, Monsuf was in the, by the Red Sea. What, 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 was, what is he rebuking them? He's rebuking them about the fact that when they were by the Red Sea and the Egyptians attacked them, they, they didn't have faith in God. And they said, right? He's rebuking them. So physically, they're located in Arvot Moab, and he's rebuking them about what took place in those, in those various locations. He's talking about those locations. That's a standard explanation. But I always thought it was a little strange. I always thought that there's something in the Peshat that I must be missing. Because if you look at the Pasuk again, look at the Pasuk again. What does Be'ayben Hayarden mean? In Be'ayben Hayarden. Ba'midbar. What does Ba'midbar mean? He was in the Midbar. What does Ba'arava mean? In the Arava. Not about the Arava. Not about the Midbar. Not about Be'ayben Hayarden. Right? The Midrash explains that Moshe Rabbeinu was talking about these places. He wasn't talking in these places. But that's all the Pasuk says. Ba'arava. What does Ba'arava mean? He was in the Araba. Then Paran, Ben Tofel, So that because of that, I always felt there's something I'm missing. And then I opened up, I opened up the Emla Mikra, and I read it, and he explained the Peshat. And I really think, I think this is the real Peshat of the Pasuk. And it is as follows. The Aribila Ben Amozek says, Ele Hadevarim. The previous words, namely the book of Bereshit, the book of Shemot, the book of Vayikra, the book of uh, Bemidbar, those words were taught by Moses in these places. And yes, that's exactly what happened. When the Jewish people were in Ayyad Hayarden, Moshe Rabbeinu taught them. When the Jewish people were in the Midbar, Moshe Rabbeinu taught them. Who were in the Arava Moshe Rabbeinu taught them, meaning this first pasuk is a summary of what was happening. Where did Moshe Rabbeinu teach the Jewish people the previous four books of the Hamash? In these places, these words that we just finished, because we all finished reading these four books, were spoken by Moses when there were the forty years in the desert. But now, now. He's going to speak to us new words. So you see how Devarim, the book of Devarim, it's not just a, again, verbatim repetition of everything that took place, right? There's going to be new things that Moshe Rabbeinu teaches to us. 
And um, I want to share, I want to read to you um, a particular chapter. There's a lot, a lot of stories in Perashat Devarim. There's a lot of information in Perashat Devarim. For no particular reason, I decided to choose the story that starts in Aliyad Hamishi. So we're going we're gonna to look at it now. So give me a moment to open it up for you. It's in Perek Bet. Pasuk Aleph. Okay, here. Yomen. Pasuk Bet, actually. We're going to start from here. Okay, so let me give you the... Um, let me give you the scenario. Let me tell you what's happening and what's being described. The scenario is as follows. Moshe Rabbeinu is not just recounting um, the laws, but he's also recounting the stories that took place. And here he's recounting how the Jewish people were going basically in this terrible circle for 40 years or 38 years actually. They were going in a circle. They weren't allowed to enter Israel. There was a Gezera. The Gezera took place on Tisha Av. The Jewish people are not going to be allowed to enter Eres Yisrael. And for 40 years, Banasov et Yamim Rabim, for 40 years, the Jewish people are just making a large, um, you know, a circular route in the desert. In the middle of the circular route is Har Se'ir, where Isav lives, and that's all they're doing. And then eventually, the old generation passes away. The people who left Egypt as adults, they die in the desert. The new generation, they're the ones who are alive, and now the time has finally arrived. The time has arrived for the Jewish people to enter the promised land. And here's what we are describing. And that's the Pasuk I'm going to read to you now. The Pasuk I'm going to read to you now is exactly that. Um, Hashem speaks to, the, to Moshe Rabbeinu to transmit the following message to the Jewish people. Rab Lachem. Enough. Enough for you. Enough. Enough of this going in circles. Enough of being stuck in the desert. That's it. You've received the full measure of punishment. The measure of punishment was you're going to die in the desert. They died in the desert. Now it's a new chapter. We're starting a new chapter. Rab Lachem. Enough. Right? Sovet Arazeh. You've been going around the mountain of Seir for decade upon decade upon decade. Enough. Henu lachem safona. The moment of truth has arrived. And he says, I want you to turn around, right? Until now, they were going in a circle. And he says, I want you to turn around towards your left. And I want you to face north. Look towards the north because right now they're a little to the south of Israel right and he says if you can imagine a map of Israel um, in your mind so they were a little to the south and now go up the Jordan River Valley go towards the north right and because now you're going to have to figure out how to actually cross the Jordan River from the east going towards the west and you're going to have to figure out a point of entry, so that's the that's that's the um, uh, that's the mission, so to speak. The mission is go to the north. As you go to the north, you're going to hit the boundary with Eretz Yisrael, and I want you to figure out where are you going to enter Israel from. There, they are well to the uh, east of Eretz Yisrael. Now, here's the challenge. It's not so simple. You just say, okay, so just enter Israel. Go to the um, go to one of the border crossings and enter. It's not so simple. In order to enter Israel, they have to pass by sovereign countries. There are countries over there, and they need to get permission to enter those sovereign countries and cross to the other side, and then leave those sovereign countries. And you're going to be entering from the east, 
going towards the west, then you're going to reach the Jordan River, and then you're going to cross the Jordan River into Israel. Where do you enter from? So it starts. So this is a new journey that is now starting. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, she'akolei amin baro. Amen. Okay. Let's continue. <clears throat> Um, you have the place here. Okay. Sablemon Atem Oberim Atun and give the following instructions to the people. Hashem is talking to Moshe, he's talking to Moses, and he's saying him, give them the following instructions. Atem Oberim. You are now going to be going where? We said they're in the south. They're going to be going north. And as they're going north, they're going to be on the eastern border of Aisab, the country, the sovereign country of Aisab, right? Um, so um, you're going to be going from south towards north. You're going to be going adjacent to the eastern border of Aisab. That's what you're going to be doing now. Now, Aisab is sitting in a place called Se'ir. That's the name of the country. Aisab was given Har Se'ir. Already in Perashat Bayishlach, you remember when Yaakov Avinu enters Eres Israel and he fights the angel? Esav goes where? Esav goes to Har Seir. That was centuries before this. Centuries before. Centuries before Esav gets to Har Seir and he's been there for centuries. For centuries. Now the Jewish people, now Yaakov is returning, so to speak. Right? If you think about it, it's crazy. Yaakov is returning. Millions of people right? And now these two brothers are sort of speaking to meet again because, but the Jewish people, Yaakov is going to be going outside the country of Esav, up from south to north by the eastern border. And remember, Israel is on the western border. So Hashem tells them, when your brother, when Esav sees you, they're going to be scared. And Hashem warns the Jewish people, you are going to be very careful. This is an interesting law. It shows you how Hashem really, he has, Hashem has an agenda. And it doesn't matter. Sometimes it's not about right. It's not about wrong. It's not about being good or bad, better. Hashem has an agenda. And he tells the Jewish people, I'm warning you about the following. And here's the warning. Antitgaruvam Okay. Okay. Yatura de Al Titkaru Bam. The warning is don't be Al Titkaru Bam. What does Titkaru Bam mean? So the three letter you know that every um, uh, verb in Hebrew um, has a three, a triliteral root, right? What is the triliteral root, the three letter root of Titkaru? And the answer is in Rabenu Yona ibn Janah. In Sefer Hashorashim, right? Again, one of the great, 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 uh, truly one of the great masterpieces. This is one of the this is one of the great masterpieces written in Jewish history, and it's so remarkable to me. This is a masterpiece, okay? An absolute masterpiece. I mean, if I had a library of a few masterpiece uh, books, and one of the books would be, of course, the Hamash, the Nevi'im, the Ketuvim. Obviously, that's that's by, that's from God. But then about the masterpiece, it would be the Gemara, the Mishneh Torah. This would be one of the masterpieces. This would be one of, like the 10 top books, one of them would be uh, Sefer HaShorashim. Remarkable to me. 
remarkable. How few people actually study the Sefer al it's, it's mind-boggling. It, it truly is. I have to say, it's just absolutely mind-boggling. How people, we have these Jewish masterpieces, and, and I'm not aware of, you know, of too many people studying it. I, it's, it doesn't seem to be that it's, it's done too much. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I just haven't been in the right places. But nevertheless. So he says, the triliteral root is Gimel Resh He. What does Gimel Gara? What does Gara mean? So for example, he brings a Pasuk in the book of Tehillim, right? I want to read to you the Pasuk in the book of Tehillim. And then you'll understand what the, what the uh, word is. Um, yeah. Oh, so he brings usage. Right. He brings, right. He first brings the, um, he brings the, the root. And then after he brings the word, he actually brings the actual cases where it's wow. used. You can see how it's used. So there's a pasuk in Tehillim, Erek Lametet, Pasuk Yod Aleph. Let me show you the pasuk so you can see it yourself. Why not? Might as well. We have this technology. Might as well use it properly. So here it goes. I'm going to show you the pasuk so you can all see it just like me. The pasuk is Tehilim. Perek Lamit Tet. Pasuk Yod Aleph. Perek Lamit Tet. Here's pasuk Yod Aleph. Um, it is a prayer. Please take away from me um, the physical pain. Sometimes a person has sicknesses, diseases, nega'im on the body. Take away the nega'im from me, um, says uh, um, um, David HaMelech. And then it says, Mitirat yadecha anichaliti. Just mitirat yadecha, just the fear of seeing your hand. You know, imagine um, Lehabdil, just Al Groti. You see, somebody's about to smack you. So you see the hand, you just see the hand. What happens when you see the hand? You get scared. Yeah. Just the fear of seeing the hand, that, that itself is, is damaging to the person, right? Even if the person doesn't actually slap you, oh my God, you, know, you, you, you got startled, but that itself is damaging. So David Amelik saying, I just see the fear of your hand, God. I see the fear of your hand, what God is capable of doing. That itself. It's, it's, it's destroying me, right? So, means the fear. So what does it mean? Now we understand the Pasuk in our case. Um, don't be afraid of them. means no. Don't cause them to be scared of you. They're already scared. They are afraid of you. As it is, they're afraid of you. Don't make them more scared. Don't threaten them. Uh, Don't threaten them. And as yes, they are scared of you. And yes, you have the military advantage. And yes, you can decimate them. And I'm warning you, no. You may not do any of those things and you may not even lift up your hand. Like, you see how beautiful the Pasuk and Tehilim is? Just, just, oh, I'm about, I'm going to give you a slap. Hey! You didn't actually slap the person, but just the fear of that. Just don't even do that. Don't even, you know, like suddenly you're taking out like the, the machine gun, like you're going to shoot. You're not going to shoot, right? You just want them to be scared, right? Don't even do that. Don't even get them the fear of your hands. I don't allow you to scare them. You have to know that Har Se'ir was promised by God to Jacob's biologically oldest son, and his biologically oldest son was Esav. Hashem promised him Har Se'ir, and that's the end of the story. Even though Esav wasn't a Sadiq, he didn't necessarily put on tefillin all his life, and yet that was Hashem's promise to Esav, he gets Har Se'ir, and you have to respect that promise. Ki Yerusha Esav, natati et Har Se'ir. I gave Har Se'ir as an inheritance. An inheritance is holy. Don't touch someone's inheritance. That's theirs. So even to cause them fear, look at this. Just to cause them fear. What, what's the big deal? I'm causing them fear. I'm, I'm threatening them. No, you can't do that. Why not? Because the Jewish people, we represent God. And if God is saying 
that Yerusha le'Aisav natati etav sa'id, and we threaten Aisav. What does that say? That says that we don't respect God. Right. We don't respect God. But God is telling you it belongs to them, and they know that God promised it to them. And you're going to lift your hand up even to threaten them, not to take it, even to threaten them, but you're creating the illusion that you're disrespecting God's promise to Aisav. You cannot do that. You see how the Jewish people have to be so careful in the way we conduct ourselves in the eyes of the nation because we are a holy nation and Hashem expects us to conduct ourselves in a special way, right? So that's the Yerushalayi Sanatati Tavsi. Let's continue in the um, let's continue in the Pesukim. Hold on one moment, please. Okay, let's continue in the Pesukim. Um... Or pasuk vav. Okay, ochel. I'll, I'll mark it here. Okay, ochel tishberu meitam bakesef vachaltem veramayim tichru meitam bakesef ushtitem avurat isbenun minehon vechaspa vetechelun veapnaya. The only thing that you may do in your interaction with the indigenous population, there's, there's an indigenous population living over there. You're going to be outside their country. You are allowed to interact with them for the purposes of purchasing food, for the purposes of, of pur purchasing water. For those two purposes, you may interact with them. Um, looking at Rabbeinu Sadia Gaon, Ulam, Tiknu Mehem Ochel Bakesef, Ve Az Tocheluhu, Ve Ramaim, Ve Az Tishtuatam. Look what Hashem is saying. That there's a certain diyuk in Rabbeinu Sadia Gaon. I don't know if anybody caught it. I'll read it again. It's a great diyuk. Ulam, Tiknu Mehem Ochel Bakesef, what does it mean? Why is God going to tell us you'll buy the food and then you'll eat the food? You'll buy the water and then you'll drink the water. Well, I mean, yeah, I'm like, geez, I'm buying food. What am I buying food for? To hang it on my wall? No, I'm buying food because I want to eat it. Why does he have to say that? You understand the question? Because it's telling us, don't you dare rob food from them. If you see a well in the, wa in the way, don't you dare take water from that well, right? Don't think that because you have a right to walk and they should be nice to you, and they should be nice to you, by the way, and we didn't do anything wrong to them, but don't think that now you can take advantage and because the right is with you, you can take the food, you can take water, you wanna eat, it's on one condition. You pay for the food. You see a tree there? You can't just take food from the tree, you know, fruit from the tree and eat it. It belongs to somebody. Pay him the money. Water. You see a well? Pay him money. Be ethical and proper in business. How, you, how do you follow the rules of ethics in business? Don't rob. It's that simple. Everybody thinks, what is the ethic? No. Just don't rob. Respect another person's property as halakha expects us to respect another person's property. So that's great musab. Look how the Jewish people interact with our worst enemy, Aisav, Halakha. Aisav sonet Yaakov, the Gemara says, Halakha. Aisav hates Yaakov, he hates Jacob. And yet, just because he hates you, doesn't give you the right to act improperly. This is what makes us who we are, right? So who we are and how we behave is not dependent on how they are and how they behave because we are not them. Great lesson. Let's continue. Let's continue. Ki Adonai Elohecha Berachicha Bechol Maseyadecha Yada Lechtecha Etamid Bar Hagadol Haze Ze Arbaim Shana Adonai Elohecha Imach Lo Hasavta 
דבר. הרי אדוני אל ההך, ברך אך, וכל עובדי ידך, סופקת לך סופקך, במהכך, יד מדברה רבה, הדן, דנן ארבעים שנים, למר אדוני לך, וסעדך, לא חסרת מדעם. Let me first look at Ankelos and see if there's anything, any nuance that I can detect. Okay. Okay, I'm looking at a bit of Sadia Gaon, one moment. Ki Adonai Elohecha, kevar birech otcha bechol amalecha, vehetiv lecha, kaasher halachta bamidbar haasum hazeh. Okay, let me explain to you what this patsuk is about um, because I understood it intuitively and it's a beautiful pasuk. So the Jewish people are about to enter Israel and it really is a problem. Hashem is telling us you have to pay for the food, you have to pay for the water and oh, well, what if they don't sell us the food? What if they don't sell us water? What if it's not that simple, right? And, and that's a legitimate question except for the following point. Hashem is the one who blesses us in everything we do. If we are successful in what we do, if we are successful in our businesses, it is because Hashem is blessing us in what we do. Specifically, the Jewish people, Hashem blessed us in everything we did. Yada lechtecha et amidbar hagadol hazeh. Hashem he um, was aware of where you were traveling, traveling in this awesome desert. I want to explain this to you because I really learned this from my father, um, and it's a special explanation. What does it mean, Yada What does it have to do with anything? Hashem knew where you were walking in this awesome desert. He actually didn't explain it to me in the context of this pasuk. As I'm reading the pasuk, I'm remembering what my father said, and I'm using that memory to explain this pasuk. But it really, as I said, is a special um, explanation. Yada lechtecha Hashem know where you went, knows where you went in this awesome desert, because here's the thing. The desert is huge. It's immense. It's endless. And if a person is lost in the desert, they can't get out. Okay. But there are Bedouins who live in the desert. They're experts in traveling through the desert. But, and it's a very big but, these Bedouins can only go in certain parts of the desert. They're not going to go every place. The Bedouins will always be in a place where there is some fountain of water, or some oasis, or some day trees. Even when they travel in the desert, they travel in known routes. They won't go off the route, because if they go off the routes, they'll be done with. But when the Jewish people traveled in the desert, we didn't go in the known traveling routes, right? There were trade routes. There was famous trade routes in the desert that everybody would travel in those trade routes. We did not go in those trade routes. We went through the awesome, endless desert in places where no one went before us and no one, no one went after us. And yet we survived. How did we survive? Nobody can survive in these places. But the answer is, Ki Adonai Elohecha Berachecha Bechol Maase Adecha Yada Lechtecha Eta Midbar Gadol Hazeh. Hashem took you in places where there is no food. Hashem took you in places where there is no water where there is no possibility to survive. Hashem took you to those places intentionally. And did you have food? Did you have water? So you survived in those places which are impossible to survive. And now you're worried about, what am I going to do now? So Hashem is saying, don't worry. I'm always taking care of you. I took care of you in the, this awesome desert, in impossible circumstances, and I will take care of you again. So don't worry. It's going to be fine. All right? Ze'ar ba'im shana. And for 40 years, for 40 years, Hashem is with us. Lo hasarta davar. And it's not just that Hashem was with us. 
You wanted for nothing. You had everything you needed. You had delicious food, sweet water, great air, clothing, shoes, everything you could possibly need. I gave it to you. So don't worry now. It's not gonna, that's not gonna stop. Let's continue the next pasuk. Let's continue the next pasuk. Vanavor. Vanavor me'et ahenu ben Isa hayoshevim beseim b'derech ha'araba me'elat u'me'asyon gaber v'nefen v'na'avor derech midbar mo'ab and eventually well you remember what happened in um, you remember what happened in Perashat Hukat I'm sure right um, in Perashat Hukat um, let me see if I can find the Pesukim eventually we um, let me just see where is it? Uh, we go through, uh, we go by uh, Aisab. And do you remember what happens with Aisab? Does anybody remember? Because I can read it for you now. I prefer to read it. But does anybody remember what happens with Aisab when they see the Jewish people walking by their desert? By, 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 in, by their, um, I'm sorry, by the boundary of their country in the desert? We ask for permission, right? We ask for permission. We ask them for permission. Please let us come into your country. We'll go in the king's road, in the road designated by the king. We will buy food from you. And what was Esav's answer? They say, you're not coming in. And they actually went and they, they started to wage a war against the Jewish people. They brought a heavy army towards the Jewish people and finally we had to leave, okay? So this is why Hashem tells the Jewish people, on the one hand, don't wage a war against them, don't threaten them, because we didn't threaten them, they went to attack us. But on the other hand, the issue, the real pressing issue was, what do you do about food? Hashem says, don't worry, it's going to be fine. And they were fine, okay? Let's continue. I just want to give you that background. So it didn't work out very nicely with Esav, notwithstanding that we were acting properly. So eventually we pass because they continue going towards the north. And as they travel towards the north, let's say this is the country of Esav. So they're starting out here, they're traveling, they're traveling, they're traveling, and then they go north of Esav, and that's it. There's no more. Bye bye. See you. Okay. We're going up and eventually we get close towards the desert of Moab, Derech Midbar Moab. So the challenge continues. And again, just to remind you, what is the challenge? The challenge is how do we enter the land of Israel? We need to find an entry point. So far, the entry point was not here. This country is not letting us go through, and Hashem is not letting us attack them. Next country, directly north of, of Se'ir, of Esav, the next country directly to the north is a country called Moab. Let's see what happens with Moab. Okay. So Hashem tells Moses, Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu, of course, um, with the message to the Jewish people. Al-Tasar et Moab. What does Al-Tasar et Moab mean? What does the word um, um, 
What does Tasar mean? Let me see if I can find it quickly in the Benu Yonai Ben Jana. Give me a moment. The trick is to find the three letter root, and I'm going to see if I can find it. Uh huh. No. Asadi, no, that was not it. Ah. Yod Sadiresh. Let me try Yod Sadiresh. I'm trying to find it. And um, I'm going to see if I can find Asa. Yod Sadi. No. Ah, yeah. Yes. No. No. It's an interesting question. What does Altas, first of all, what does Altas Aret Noah mean? So it, um, I'm going to give you the, uh, let me see what Abinu Sadegaon says. Velatit Harish al Ta'asem Masor ala Mu'adim. So um, Masor in Hebrew is a siege. So don't place a siege around Mu'ab. Don't siege them. Don't besiege uh, Mu'ab. Um, give me one more minute. Maybe I will still find something in Sarara. Uh, so Sadi Resh Resh, maybe. Maybe Sadi Resh Resh. What, what did you say? I? No. No, not at all. No. Sarar. Satam. Sadiresh Hayat. Sadiresh Kav. Okay. So I will try to do this as a private homework assignment. Figure out what the triliteral word of Ah, Sor. Maybe Sadi Vavresh. One more thing. And if I don't get it, I promise you we will continue studying in the time that we have left. Sor. Sadi Vavresh. So let me see. Maybe that's what it is. Uh huh. Asadi vehavav. Where is Asadi vav? So Sara Sur. Okay, let's see if that's the right word. Sur. Okay, Sur olamim. No. Ah, yes, I was right. So I found it. So the three-letter word is Sadi Vavresh, Sur, right? So for example, there's a pasuk that says, Kitasur El-Im, Kitasur El-Ir Yamim Rabbim. Kitasur El-Ir Yamim Rabbim means the situation is that you are placing a, um, you know, encircling a city, right? placing a siege around the city for many days. So the Pasuk says that you're not allowed to eat the fruit, uh, you're not allowed to cut down the fruit trees, right? It's a special law. You're not allowed to cut down the fruit tree. So al tasar et Mu'ab literally means exactly what I said. It means do not place a siege around the city of Mu'ab. Mu'ab. The al garba min hama. Furthermore, do not um, cause them, al garba min hama means don't instigate them to start a war, right? Don't instigate them to attack you. And why am I asking you not to instigate them to attack you? Because kilo eten lecha me'arso, because you are not going to get this land. Ki libnelot natati et ar Yerusha, I promise this land, the city of Ar, the, the region, what's called Ar, this place I gave this place to the children of Lot. You remember that when Abraham Avinu left his country, who joined Abraham Avinu? Lot. Lot was Abraham Avinu's nephew, right? So Lot has a special privilege because he was close to Abraham and because Abraham loved him. That love is 
now the love that Abraham had towards Lot is now going to protect the children of Lot, even though they are not necessarily deserving. And yet Hashem is going to protect the children of Lot and the children of Abraham are not allowed to even instigate a war against them. So I see somebody was helping. Very good, David. Uh, David Jacob, excellent. You could have um, said it out loud next time and I would have um, allowed you to, uh, to do it. But you're right, Sur. Excellent. Where, where are you from, if I may ask, if, you, if you're not embarrassed to talk? If you are, then you don't have to unmute yourself. Borough Park. Excellent. Excellent. Hazaku Baruch. So yes, Sur. Very, very good. So, um, so that's, so that's Al-Tasarit Mo'ab. Al-Tasarit Mo'ab, to besiege them because the promise, the love of Abraham is going to protect the children of Lot and it's theirs. Hashem gave them Moab. And what happened? Ha'emim lefanim yashvu baha am gadol verab varam ka'anakim emetanem lekadmin yetivu baha amra besagi betakib gerit baraya Wow, this is a very interesting pasuk. So, when the children of Lot were going to go and conquer the land that was promised, in this case, Moab. The, Moab, was, uh, uh, he had two children. There was Moab and there was Ammon. So this is Moab. When they were going to conquer this land, the indigenous population, there were a type of people that were called Emim. The word Emma in Hebrew, means scary, horrifying. Um, we don't have any pictures of what they look like, but apparently they looked scary, right? These emim, these people, they were the indigenous population in that part of the world. Again, this is to the east of the Jordan River, right? And I don't know where they come from. I really find this confusing. I find this confusing because Noah had three children, Shem, Ham, uh, and, and Yefet. And who are these Amim? Meaning from an anthropological perspective, who are they? Right? An interesting question. So nevertheless, they, apparently they're from Canaan, from Ham, but still it's, it, it, it puzzles me. Why should you have these giant, you know, strange looking, genetically powerful creatures? We also had in Kiryat Arba, similar... Um, a similar situation in the city of Hebron, where you have the do giants. We, do we know that they were actually giants because uh, um, Ankelus says uh, Gabaria, like they're strong. So uh, do we know for a fact that that's the Peshat, that they were actual giants? Just It question. says, well, it's, uh, well, first of all, that's a good point. For, first of all, it's a very good point. Okay. Um, let me look at the, um, let me look at first the figura of Venus on, okay? Because you, you, you re reach, the, well, I think me and you can agree that even if they weren't giant, they were powerful, they were genetically different. But apparently, Gibaraya, it was a type of strength that came from their size. That, that, when I say giant, I don't mean like the jolly green giant, you know, in the, or, you know, Jack and the Beanstalk. I, you know, I mean, big people, you know, they were, they were genetically very, very big. Um, so like Goliath, Goliath is another example. Apparently Goliath, it seems that he was like nine feet tall. Again, that, you know, not Jack and the Beanstalk, but very, very big, right? So who are these giants or who are these very big people? I don't know. I don't, again, and from, it would be fascinating when the Mashiach comes to understand this from an anthropological perspective, given the fact that the Mabul wiped out everybody. So who was left, right? So who are these giants? But they were here. We know that. It was Kiryat Arba. It was here. It was later on. We're going to see um, another group of uh, weird-looking people in the uh, Perasha, the next few Pesukim, if we get there. Uh, so there was the Emim. The Emim was one of them. So we Rabbeinu Sa'adah Ga'on. Rabbeinu Sa'adah Ga'on and the Emim. Ve'ha'em matnim. means matilim ema. Those who are, they, they cause, when they look at you, they cause you to be, to, to shudder in fear. Right? Kemoha giborim. What does it mean, kemoha giborim? They were like giants. Anakim ben Van Giborim. Aha. Anakim. 
that we want to give Bonim, right? So the tendency seems to be more, not that they were giant necessarily in their height, but they were giant in their strength. They had the strength of giants, right? So that would, that would be, uh, Nathan, in line with your point about Ankelos, which is Gibaraya. So you see, the Benus Leon has a similar tendency. That nece not necessarily crazy height, but more just very, very powerful. Okay? Uh, let's continue. Let us continue. Um, with, uh, one second. Okay. Lefaim, Yahashebu Afem Kanakim, Veham Moabim, Ikrulahem Emim. Um, where a pasu Gibaraya mit Hashvin at Inun ke Gibaraya, Umo Avae, Karanehon Emetane. Vehem Gam Yahashbu Amisim. Kemo Hagiborim. Right. The Benu Sadag on Bereshit Yod Daled. Hey. Interesting. Give me a moment. I think I know what he's referring to. Just give me a moment to get the other, the book of Bereshit. All right, just one moment, and then we'll, we're almost done. I know that we have another five minutes, so we're good. Um, you're done it here. Let me open up the pasuk for you also here. Your Dalit. Okay. Okay. So here you have the Pasuk. This is a famous war, right? Uh, the Hamisha Melachim, the four Melachim during, um, the four Melachim coming from Babel, doing Melacha against uh, uh, Milhama, a war against the five Melachim in the area of uh, Yam Hamela. You see the word Refaim here? The Ashterot Karnaim. So the Refaim, they were scary looking creatures. Um, and they were, they were there. And the five Melachim, they destroyed these, these scary looking creatures. But Yakuet Refaim, the Ashterot Karnaim. So give me a moment. I want to see if Rabbi Abraham bin Harambam has an explanation of who these Refaim are. So Pereshit Perek Yod Daled Pasuke. Unfortunately, tragically, we don't have many of the things of the Biyamran bin Anambam are missing. Wow. And tragically, this is, this is missing from the book. So, okay. How about, I thought we would, uh, I thought we would see it. Okay. So, Refaim, Yachashubah, Kanakim. Also, these Refaim, they were, um, um, they, they had the uh, appearance of, of giants because they were so powerful. Right? They have Mo'avim, Yikriulahim, Emim. But the Mo'avim refer to this Refaim as Emim. So the Refaim here, Vayakuet Refaim Be'ashterot Karnaim, those Refaim are the Emim, meaning these people, they were called Refaim by other nations, but the Mo'avim called them Emim, because against the Mo'avim, they were particularly terrified by them. So they call them those who cause horror, right? And here is where. This apparently is where Hashem gave it to, um, to Lot, because Lot was one of the people that was taken in this war, in Perashat Lech Lecha, right? Right? That they took in Yishba Achiv, that they took Lot, right? Which was his nephew, it's called Achiv. And then Avraham Avinu conquers this land. And I would, I would venture to, to, to speculate that as a result of this war, that Lot ended up, settling in the place where the Refaim were. So you see the connection between Perashat Lech Lecha, which describes the war where the four kings come from Babel, they wipe out the Refaim, 
that the Moabim called Emim. The Moabim wouldn't do it because they were terrified. They were terrified. But these four kings come from the, um, uh, the, the eastern part of the world, Babylonia, that part of the world. They wipe out the Rephaim. Abraham pushes away these four kings. He decimates them. And then, because Abraham Avinu got that, I would suspect this is where um, this is where Lot and Lot's children ended up getting this, this country. You see the, uh, the connection why I brought you this parasha? You see the connection between the two parashiot? Because it shows you how they got it. They got it here. They got it in parashat Lech Lecha. This is a place, okay? All right, so let's continue. Yes, uh, yes. Right. Yeah, it was not Ol Melech Bashan. Yes, that's right. And it says so in this week's parasha. Um, at the end of the parasha, it says, um, it says, at Og Melech Bashan. Right. Um, Kirak Og Melech Bashan. I'm going to show you the actual pasuk in Perek. Um, let me take you back to the parasha. I'm going to show you the actual pasuk. It, it's in Perek Gimel. And Og Melech Bashan himself. Now here, Now when he was a little baby, this Og Melech HaBashan, who was part of the Refaim group, and by the way, this shows that they actually were giants. So I guess now we can put this, we can put this to rest. They were apparently very scary. They were very powerful, but they were also very big. I don't know that they were very big. Okay. So here is how I know. Og Melech HaBashan, he was the last of the Mohicans. He was the last of the Rafaim. He was killed by Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu killed this guy. Okay. Now, when they got to the city where Og Melech HaBashan was, they found his baby cradle. His baby cradle was made out of iron. Now, this guy was a tough guy. Usually with babies, he put them with pillows and blankets and teddy bears. You know, he had an iron... <laughs> he had an iron crib. Amon, And we know exactly we found it when we got to a place called Rabbah, which was in the country of Ammon. And you want to know what the size of this baby crib was? Kesha Amot Orka. That's four and a half meters long. Two meters wide. So this baby was a mean, tough baby. And he was big. He was big, okay? The Hachamim actually, I think Ibn Ezra, he does a calculation how big he must have been as a baby. Nevertheless, I think we've reached the end. Um, fascinating, just to hear, it reads, you know, this is from an anthropological perspective. This is a fascinating parasha. And um, I was always very intrigued by it, so I just wanted to share some of my uh, enthusiasm and some of my thoughts uh, with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. And next week is Tisha B'Av, so no class. I think we're all going to be uh, praying for the rebuilding of the Beit HaMikdash and hopefully um, eating a good meal uh, thereafter. You know, the Hakam used to give a class on Tisha B'Av the hour before with oh, yeah. Koach and Gvuda. I'll Every think about day. it. I would definitely think I'm not, about it. I'm not putting you on the spot. I'm just letting you know I have fond memories. Maybe yeah, I will. Maybe. I will consider it. I will take no, it under uh, advisement. No, uh, no pressure. Okay. Okay. Have a good night. Thank you so much. Have a good night.